Hello and welcome Hi. to Rep Radio. It's our 90th uh, podcast in this particular form. It's a mini milestone. I like the number 90. It's good, isn't it? On the scale of numbers, how good the number is it? It's good because it's even. And I like even numbers. You do. Very much so. What's the rule of thumb when it comes to volume on devices? I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> so it has to be an even number. It can never be an odd number. It can only be an odd number if it's an even style odd number. Like 25. 25 is an acceptable odd number, 15 is an acceptable odd number, 5 not so much, don't ask me why. So it, it, so it has to be an even number unless it's incre- <laughs> it, it, uh, once, until you get past 10, in which case it can be increments of 5. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Um, that wasn't the kick-off question. I literally live my life by that, by the way. <laughs> like he, he will be in the car with me, putting the volume up, or in your car, just putting it up once to see if I notice, and I'm like, fucking hell, like, just turn it down. <laughs> I used to do it all the time. But the car, the car, the key of Picanto from back in the day, a wonderful little machine. And yeah, that just like, because the, the subtleties, the sounds, you know, sometimes ones, one time. How does it handle it? Because on modern tellies, yeah, like, the, there's a big if, difference. Well, if, the, if there's, Sometimes they do like those in between the lines. What about your bedroom telly? Because you can wake your kids up quite easily with with, with if your telly volume goes goes askew. I've never really noticed that our telly's in the in a wardrobe, isn't it? So it's like it's directionally it's like pointed yeah. forwards directly to our bed, essentially. <laughs> but some tellies have that like heart, like no line, then a line. You've always got to put it on the line. I know. Oh god, I don't think tellies even do that anymore. That I don't know. I'm just something back that in the I days of, back in the days of teletext. Yeah, yeah. I the, the students also had that. Um, anyway, the kickoff question this week comes from Jay Ellis, Joshua, John Ellis on Twitter. Says, Pepe Reina, 2006-2007, or Allison this year? Who are you going for? I don't even think it's close. I'm going for Allison this season. I think it it's it should be close. I think as ever. The fact that we've got Alison here right now, and it's been so long, and we had to we had to live through the tail years of Pepe Reina a little bit, kind of does it. That to that, you know, after he he basically won us the FA Cup. Everyone goes about the Gerrard final. Pepe Reina won that FA Cup for us just as much as Steven Gerrard did, um, and he was even better. And I actually think up to like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I thought he was he was absolutely peak. Um, but I do agree with you ultimately that Alison is. Pepe Reina was almost a prototype in that in that regard. He was quite ahead of his time in how he how, how he's a goalkeeper. I think he was much better aerially than Allison is, and uh, just in terms of his punching and stuff, I think Allison gets away with a, gets away with some stuff more. And that might be a height thing because when you're big, you tend not to be as good at jumping because you de- you've never really had to jump a lot. They always said that about Peter Crouch. Yeah, it's uh, and well, you know, Ronaldo's tall and he's like the best leaper. Well, that's world. why he's unstoppable, isn't it? You know, you, that's the thing. You, you, a lot of players, a lot of people don't. You don't. It's just not a necessary, not a necessary thing. Um, Barry Reina was absolutely phenomenal, and we used to go on about his distribution, but Allison's distribution. I think it's. I think you know. I think the way that you said it then, with it being a prototype, is the exact right way of saying it. I think if you put Pepe Reina in to this league, not just this team, now he might be above average on his distribution, and he probably is above average. But he was way ahead of the time mm. back then. I think the, the game's changed so much. It's like I always think of Gary Neville as one of the best fullbacks the league's seen. Throw him in a modern side, <laughs> looks crap. Okay. Crucified yeah, these you know days, I mean? like yeah, definitely, um, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see that. Like, obviously, he's 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 in the final final days of his career, really, isn't he, Pepe? But he's the people often ask this, like, about the backup goalkeeper situation. I'd love it's, it. We've missed the boat on Reina, but like any Pepe over any time over the last four years while he's not been at the club would would have been a perfect understudy for Allison. That you know, someone who comes in who just it's like. Um, Warm at space, yeah. you know. You get a guy who comes in and he plays, he plays the, same the same way, so you don't have to completely change. Like Mignolet plays a completely different way, so it, it, it compromises what we try to do. Yeah, um, interesting question. Thank you very much for that, uh, Josh. If you disagree with us, by all means, please use the comments section or tweet at the Redman TV. Um, let's get into your news and brief then. Um, Trent out injured for a month, Chris. All of a sudden, all that chat of wasn't he dead brave and playing through and played played the full 90 minutes even though he's meant to be injured. Um, doesn't look quite so brilliant. And no, it looks a, bit, a little bit silly now, doesn't it? But do you get the three points without him? That's a good point. No one's, I've, I've heard no one say that and, you know, sliding doors, you may, you may not. Mm. Um, we got the three points, that's what mattered then. 
Uh, we've got another few games where we'll probably he'll probably miss three or four games maybe. Um, I think you know what it boils down to on this one is that everybody's talking about the Nathaniel Klein stuff. Yeah, and I, I feel like I addressed this pretty well last week or the week before. Is that well, it'll be immediate reaction. You you can't help without having without looking into it or analysing it. Liverpool, I've got Gomez out injured at the moment, albeit back soon. Trent out injured, and our next choice, our or other right back, we've just let go out on loan. So top line, it seems like a criminal oversight from Liverpool to to let him go, and that that's a typical thing for us to do is we've cut off our nose despite our face. Yada yada yada. I understand why people are wound up by it. But it is very much a top line analysis of the situation. Yeah, I think. Look, you know, I said before, Paul Klopp is the manager that he is because of who he is, and he's the type of person who will let a player go if they're unhappy, who doesn't want to be there, who doesn't want to fight for it. Klein was one appearance away if we were win to win the league of getting a medal. Mm-hmm. He doesn't get a medal now, and I kind of respect that a little bit from yeah. Nathaniel Klein. You know, he wants to go out there, he wants to play football, he doesn't want to be behind a twenty-year-old lad yeah. vying for a right-back spot at his age of his career, and I kind of respect that. What I do think could have been done is that Nathaniel, you can go out, just give us the end of January, mate. Mm-hmm. That's what I think could have been done, rather than the first week in January when the window's just opened. Yeah. Let us get through these injuries because they're coming back. Yeah, and we'll let you go at the end of the month. It's mate. tough. You isn't never it? know. You're going to get a game against Wolves. You don't know what's coming down the line. It's but interesting. You don't know whether Bournemouth would accept something like Exa- that. Exactly. Well, exactly that because it's interesting because what the Neil Warnock stuff off the back of it kind of let us into a little peek into the world of what's happening for these football clubs. You know, he missed out. He said in his own words, he missed out on on other right back options and another four because you can only have so many into Premier League loans you can't use that space up so they didn't want it they, when they think something's going to happen so Bournemouth probably couldn't afford to sit by in fact because of the Cardiff stuff they probably were like well it's it's kind of now or never if you want him you'll have him now or, he's go, or he'll be a Cardiff, a Cardiff instead so I, it, it's funny how it does work out and maybe there would be a regret from Klein because you know he could have just stuck it out another week and he'd have got his, he'd have got the best of both worlds he gets to have his Premier League medal and he gets to have his move as well but you can't you can't live like that, can you? You know that that's that you know. No, and if if you believe everything that Dave Maddox saying on Twitter about Klopp being happy that Milner's going to have more chance to be in. Uh, be an influence on this side, be it at right back, be it off the bench in midfield, or maybe as a starter in midfield, then take him, take the manager at his words, you know, mm. or take Maddox at his words because he knows what he's doing. Like. I lost my head. The biggest I've lost my head on Liverpool was this time last season when we saw Coutinho. You did, you did a rant video on it? Yeah, I did a rant video on it. It's the first time I've ever lost my head in that way about yeah. something that's going on when really the club's moving in the right direction. You know, I truly believed at the time that it was a terrible decision and I was proved wrong. And that was Phil Coutinho. Yeah. A world class attacking midfielder. This was our third choice right back that yeah. we've let out. Yeah. I'm not going to lose sleep over this yeah. in the same way that I lost sleep over Phil Coutinho you, because the manager's got enough credit in the bank and he's done enough in his career for me to say no more than me. Yeah, I, I, I think we're so scared of everything, aren't we? We're so scared, scared of everything going wrong, and this is one of those prime examples of this could be a, this could prove to be an absolutely terrible, terrible thing. But you can't. You have to plan for the positive. You have to have backup plans in place. Liverpool have backup plans in place, as mentioned. James Milner can do the job. Push comes to shove. Fabinho can do the job. Push comes to shove. Jordan Henderson can do the job. Gini Wijnaldum can do the job. Rafa Camacho can do the Joe job. Kiana Hoover can do the job. Joe Gomez will be back soon enough and, and, and do the job. So we're not we're not desperate. Now, if Liverpool were to pick up another injury, then that then that starts to make it increasingly more difficult. It does. Or you have a setback to go. These things happen, but... You can't, there's a limit to what you can legislate for. There just is. There's a limit to what you can plan for, and, and you can't. You can't Listen, keep Klein, you can't keep a player who doesn't want to who doesn't want to play for. If Klein was so desperate to not play to, to go and play elsewhere, then as you say, he opted to give up on a chance of winning a Premier League to go and play for Bournemouth. So to go and play for Bournemouth, where he's really got no chance of winning anything, anything ever. Yeah. ever. For the rest of his career, he might have a ch- he might sorry he might have a chance of getting back to a big big club, yeah. And he might co- he might f- force our manager to change his mind about mm. him, um, but he wasn't going to get the opportunities. Now you, you look at Nathaniel, and he's a good player, but I do feel like the team's moved on slightly from him. You know, he's a very 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 good fullback, yeah. 
maybe not in this Liverpool side. This this team is accelerated past the team. It's like you know, it's, you've used the old Mario Kart thing of having like the the the, the ghost basically, where you, you see your previous best lap and you race against yourself effectively. Liverpool are doing that, and there's areas of this team where it, we've accelerated past our previous self quite easily. Now we've done that at the back. Virgil Van Dijk, uh, you know, head and shoulders quicker and better and stronger than the, 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 than we've had that's gone before. I'm similar with Allison. Some players have taken a little bit longer. I think Nick Daniel Klein showed with his performance against Manchester United, and I think he's shown from what I'm, I'm told, he's shown his performances so far for Bournemouth that the, it's not a massive drop off. This is a very very talented international class. Fullback, it's night and day in certain areas, but like, and similar like Jordan Henderson, we might find in another year's time that you know, we, we with, with another purchase in midfield and Fabinho emerging that we that we outgrow Jordan Henderson the way that we've outgrown Lalana and we've outgrown probably we're getting towards outgrown Matter, Lover, and Mignolet, etc. But that's the thing with, with Klein, he's very, he is very, very good, and you, you would be, he would be. Uh, at least in contention for the first team slot for the vast majority of teams in the Premier League, even probably a lot of the the, the, the top four sides. Just the pe- it, it's horses, of course. Depends what you're looking for, and obviously for our style of play, he's only ever going to be a seven out of ten. Has anybody backwards. thought that Klopp actually might prefer Milner as an option there hmm. to Klein? Has anybody better actually the, thought that better on the ball? He is you know, and the, how many how many right backs can you carry? Mm. You know, we had Trent Alexander Arnold, he's the number one. You've got Joe Gomez, he's injured, okay. You've got then Nathaniel Klein, you've got James Milner. The question I mean, is how many specialists can you can that's you carry? The thing because he Klopp doesn't particularly like specialists. I think he understands that he's got a he, he's gonna have a big squad, but he's not gonna have the biggest squad. And what you need when you haven't got the biggest squad is lads you can play in all different positions. Man City have been playing Fabian Delph at left back. Because fucking Ashley Young. Well, exactly. Ashley Young's made a career, a lateral and, career. Antonio Valencia. You know, they, they, you know. I mean, granted to them, you know, they, they've, they've decided that they are fullbacks. You know, like it's not they're not doing a makeshift job. Someone can they convey to them that's what what they are. You know, but it, as you say, in, in terms of the, the the specialist thing, you can't keep a fucking. We, we barely have room for them on the bench. You know, like there was Andy Robertson is the best left back in the world right now. He couldn't get on our bench at a point last season because we just haven't got the room for a guy who can only play who can only play left back. So if you're gonna be a specialist, you need to be a world class specialist to get to get in this to get in this squad. And I don't think that that's what it is. And it's no it's not criticism of Daniel Klein. I would be made up to have him here available too. So I would be breathing. I'd be much more comfortable and much more happy. To have Nathaniel Klein available to us, but we don't. But I'm not asked. Also, I'm not totally asked because it's James Milner. We'll see. We'll see how he fares. But he's good in the tackle. He's got great, great reading of the game. He understands how the team works. He's played in a bunch of positions in the team, so he's got that understanding as well. He's dead experienced. He's a cool head. He's great in attack. As Listen, well. and the other thing that you know we didn't mention it on the build-up show for this game, but he's a very good set piece taker. He's a, he's probably our best corner taker. Okay, yeah. you know. Shikari's stepped up over the last couple of weeks, but beyond that, no. Yeah. Trent's the only other one, isn't he? And yeah. Trent's out. Yeah, absolutely. So I think James Milner being in the side is a good thing. And yeah. you know, I wonder whether people will revise their opinions if James Milner's the one that gets the assist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gini Van Alden, we know he's uh, out as well, certainly for the weekend. Past that, we're not too sure at the moment. But uh, big mess. Yeah, he's been great this season. I think we're, we're lucky. The timing of this has been slightly fortuitous in that matter of coming back. It just seems to have come back. He's tagged Genie out as he's come back in, which means Fabinho can go into midfield. And so we're not we're not desperately short. Um, I don't think but we you were anyway. Like to... it, it, it felt like if Matip isn't ready and available, which I think he will be. Sometimes there's you know I've already mentioned it earlier the sliding doors thing. Is that Kaita's in? Mm. You know what I mean? I think you know to see a Henderson and a Kaita midfield or a Kaita and a Fabinho midfield is something that I'd like to see. Home game against our team lower down the yeah. division is one of those games where you would be all right with it. Yeah. Although I think I'd, I would absolutely prefer Genie to be fit, and I would absolutely prefer Fabinho to be alongside Jordan Henderson. But you never know how the dynamic changes. Do you these injuries? Yeah. Listen, Trent, Trent gets a start because of an injury. Yeah. Doesn't he? Yeah, and he takes that place. Yeah, absolutely. And two two years ago today as well, and Nathaniel Klein's gone out on loan because of it. Exactly, and I think that I th- what it, more the concern is just in terms of the midfield taking two men out of the midfield. We, we've largely got what three guys that we hundred percent trust in a two-man midfield, and then you're talking Milner and Cater could 
there's no reason why they can't do it because they're midfielders. But you then, if you're then forced to play one of them in that, forced to, you're then looking to, do we need to change the formation if something happens beyond that? If you want, you know, you, you can't rotate I, that in I the, don't in think the, in there's game. a problem with Kaiser being as part of it too. I just don't think we've seen it yet. Yeah. I think that's the, that's why that's why you're scared. But yeah. he did it at Leipzig. He's done it in his career before. He's played in a two-man midfield. The the reason I actually think that he hasn't utilised him in a two is because I think he's struggling with the pace of the games. Mm. And I think you just get that little bit more time and space on the wing. And, and he's I think kind he's of trying to introduce him in that way to try and get his confidence you up a little bit. see how he plays. Yeah. He, he, play, he wants to take people on. He's very aggressive in possession. Now, if you're not up to, quite up to speed of the league, you can see it. Look what happened against... against what was it the weekend? Um... Brighton, you know, we he nearly threw it away. Not going to help you out there. He nearly, like, you're going to have to come to this one on your own. Listen, Wolf. He nearly, you know, he nearly threw it away because of that, and he's got that in him. Naby Keita has won a game where he just does something daft in possession. Now, I, I, I it starts to make me feel it's very Luis Garcia in that regard. You know, I can see that I don't think he will be unilaterally loved by our fan base because of that. Because if you're a guy who, try, who tries things, you inevitably you're the guy who fails things because. You can't win 100% of your battles when you're taking people on in, in dribbles and what have you. So, he, um, I, th- I wonder if it, that's it. That, that until we see proven otherwise, and with the evidence that we've seen, you're not, you're not relying on him mm-hmm. in that in that position because he's just too close. Mm-hmm. He's too close to the dangerous area of the pitch if he's playing deeper. Whereas I can understand playing him a bit further, forward, put him in the three behind Salah because. Yeah, go and do go and do that. Go and char- charge people. Well, well, exactly, ex- exactly. Do you remember that though. turn he did in the left back position though? Mm. Early on in the season, I mean that was wondrous. Oh, Palace. wondrous. Yeah, Palace wondrous. Away. Yeah, brilliant. He's, he's, he's class, isn't he? And I'm sure it'll come good for him. Um, Liverpool have been training a new training kit. Not particularly interesting in and of itself because it's just clothes, isn't it? But I thought it was, uh, what I I find interesting about this. Uh, I don't think we did it prior to last season, but we very very clearly did this when they came back into into, into January training. And I, I think about the Klopp thinks a lot about these things, the psychological impact of the, the you know, clothes make it the man, that kind of stuff, and how we did it last year. You know, you came back, you you being you talking about being refreshed and reinvigorated and, and bonding the group together, and just to help it from getting stale. And have it, you you come in, is some fresh threads for you to to try. It's it's not a it's not a big thing. It's not a massive deal. But I love the fact that. These are the little considerations that go into how we construct what we do at, uh, at Melwood. Maybe. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I can speculate. Um, I know that Klopp, as you mentioned, is is massively into that type of thing, and you could understand if that was a reason why. You could also understand if it was the marketing team going, "Let's get this out there and let's build up a bit of a a, a bit of a head of steam on for when, when it goes on sale." But players do, I think, like that. I've been watching. Um, all or nothing on Michigan University, um, the U, and they go. Their players went mad for the Michigan boots, absolutely like screaming and like they're just jumping up and down, and they've got these branded Michigan boots that they've always wanted and all that type of stuff. So I can understand why a group of fellas in that environment that will give them a little bit of juice. Just actually, it's just one of the things. It's just it just breaks up the monotony. It just makes the thing that seems all of a sudden. You just have to switch on a bit more. That little bit of complacency of, I know what everyone looks like. I know what everyone is. It's a bit second nature to me to like, oh, even just that little thing. It just requires you to switch on a bit more to do it, and it gives you a bit of a lift. No one, no one's day was made worse by giving a fresh set of nice clothes. You know what I mean? It always does add something. So yeah, just one of those things. I've been told, and I actually something I asked Klopp about in the summer about his impact on the training stuff. And again, he. You know, he it's it's important. It's very very important to him because, again, marginal gains. If you don't feel comfortable, or if you feel like you look like a bell end, you, you're having to do work psychologically to go to, to to reassure yourself that you don't before you even get into the work that you're meant to be thinking about. And if that's a one percentage thing, if that causes one bit of pause for thought, it's get it's just stuff that's getting in the way of what you're what you're trying to trying to achieve. So yeah, uh, fascinating stuff. And it's it's mad because you, I hear loads of little stories and I've told some of them to you, uh, some on camera, some off camera, of all these mad things that are going on around Liverpool that we're just not privy to. But when you get a, a conversation with a specialist in in an outside field who has an impact on on what Liverpool do, you don't we have as fans have got no real idea of the scope 
because we've all got experience of football, and we and fundamentally, it's eleven fellas walking onto a uh, walking onto a, onto a pitch and putting on a kit and kicking a ball around. But like the level of like sci-fi that goes on behind the scenes is absolutely. We had one yesterday. Yeah, absolutely real about like player tracking and stuff like just. Crazy, absolutely bonkers. Um, so the, the agenda for this has had to be changed. I, I guess this stuff will, will have been. We did a good like 10, 15 minutes on the build up show. It's had to be cut out because we, Sadio Mane apparently came out with some absolutely outlandishly bold quotes about Liverpool. And Didn't their sound chances. like him. Yeah, um, he basically the, the 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 line that got picked up was saying this is not a this is not a team of chokers. We will be champions. Um, it's been vociferously denied by Sadio Mane since the Echo have gone on record with this. And um, first and foremost, it, it, what it looks like is that the world's worst newspaper has just made up an absolute load of horse shit, which should come as no surprise to anyone, and peddled it um, because there was no legitimate citation for where these quotes were coming from. No one could find any video of it or, or whatever. It was reportedly something that he said at the uh, African Player of the Year Awards to a local... To a, mm. Yeah, I know, honestly. To a local institution. What was that? You know, that's then, that's then been, it's taken this long to get it and translate it and, or something. Um, but obviously, for those who haven't seen it, it was again, it was Manny basically expounding on this notion that Liverpool are not, are not scared. And what we got to... The, it's, it's interesting, though, because... Now that we know it's not real, are you? How do you feel? Are you? Because my my opinion on it was it's brilliant that he thinks like that, and my guess is he thinks like that anyway. Yeah, he just hasn't verbalised it. Am I asked? No, probably mm. not. It was so unlikely that Sadio Mane did this. You know what I mean? He is notorious, like the the Northwest Press Pack hate being handed Sadio Mane as an interview in press conferences and all that stuff because he doesn't talk, he hates it, he hates doing interviews, it's why he doesn't do them. The idea that even back, at, you know, he'd gone back to Africa for a big party, you know, the African Player play of the Year Awards. Just went to laugh at my, uh, Salah really, didn't yeah, he? Yes, yeah, buzz off Salah's dancing. Um, the idea that, you know, it's one of those things that it didn't feel totally un... I'm like, no, no, I don't think enough people questioned it. If you, you listen, there is a. I don't know this because I've never been elite at anything in my entire life. But there is a mentality we talk about you it. An elite, elite restaurateur. There is a mentality that people need to get to the top of what they're doing, mm -hmm. and you know, I think back to the storage and the religion stuff, and I used to think that got him to where he is. Yeah, leave him alone. Yeah. Whether you believe in it or you don't, leave him alone because he believes in it, and it gets him to win. And he's got him, he got him bloody far, mate. He was mm. playing for England. He was banging goals in in the Premier League. Yeah. He, he was an elite centre forward, hurt through injury, unfortunately. And Sadio Mane will think about that. He won't be going into games thinking he's going to get beat. He won't be going into games thinking he's crap. He'll be going in thinking he's the best player on the pitch, and he wants to prove it. Yeah. And he'll be he'll be furious that Salah plays in the same side as him, but he'll love it at exactly the same time because that's what the elite mentality is. And so he can think it all day long. He can say it if he fucking wants. I'm not asked yeah. because I don't want Liverpool going into games thinking we're going to get beaten by fucking Crystal Palace at home. That's not the mentality that you yeah. want. I have gone into football. Do you think matches. Arsenal's invincibles went through the season thinking we're going to get beat here eventually no they went in thinking we're going to do this did you think the centurions thought they were going to end up on 99 no they went to try and fucking achieve it and they thought they were the best in the world and they went and proved it yeah, yeah absolutely I, I think about thematic time and maybe this is where it comes down to again this this lack of an elite exp elite experience elite mentality I, i've gone into plenty of football matches thinking we're gonna get tonked here yeah or thinking i've got no idea how this is good how this is going to go down and you know, and you and you and you wary, and you and you see it, you see it happen before your eyes, and you're like, oh well, I'll, we'll see how it goes, and we'll make a judgment as it goes along. These guys don't have any of that. They've gone from you know, we as much as we live in fear, and we go, we we live in fear that it's all going to come collapsing down around our ears because it's happened to us plenty of times before. In the reality, and so people look at Liverpool's near misses and think, well, that's just a sign that Liverpool are big bottlers, and it's going to happen again and again and again. That squad don't think that. Jürgen Klopp doesn't think that. They look at it from the absolute positive perspective of, 
we've made it to three cup finals and yes we lost them but we made it there and we made it under these circumstances in the first year and then we made it to a Champions League final and that, I think sometimes we denigrate that I think I don't know why I don't know how it ends up being a bad thing and it's probably because it was such an outlier so it felt maybe it felt a bit 13-14 like Liverpool came out of nowhere to be in a, in a Champions League final we need to get to probably like the semi-finals a few times for us to feel like it's that's a spell of Liverpool being a dominant a dominant force again to truly appreciate what we've done. But these players don't do that. Whether they whether it's true or not, it's not how they think. And it's not and it's how they're sold. Jurgen Klopp comes in and goes. He said it again. He said it to us. You know, this is it's a bounce back's not an, a, not an opportunity. It's a it's a duty or whatever. That that was his mantra. You got here. You were good enough to get to a Champions League. On another day, you would you be European Cup champions. Now, what are you going to do about it? You're going to cry about it. Are you going to cry about it, you little dickhead? No, you're going to pick yourself up, you're going to dust yourself down. You're not worse. You're even better at football now. And you're better and you're stronger and you're more mature and you're wiser and you're fitter and you're all these things. Let's go into it and hunt it you're down. You're also tired from the World Cup. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but you're far of a little rest. But, you know, it's, you know that, and that's, you're dead right on all that stuff. I think we I think we as fans are just massive shit houses, And uh, I'm kind of upset that some of these things are not real because I like the I like the fucking bollocks of it. It reminded me of when Rafa come out ahead of the Champions League semi-final with Chelsea in 2005 and said, we'll win. And it was like, what the hell? What Rafa had been so just reserved and so calm the whole way, just come out and went, just scored like that. Come on then, we're doing this. We're, you know, we're going to get, we're going to get to the final. We're going to go and do, and, and do this. And it was so out of character, and it was so out the blue. It it made, you know what I mean? It was so inspiring. It jolted the, yeah. the lads, didn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah, Rafa was the manager that he was, and so for, as you say, for it to be so out of character, it had an effect. It's like it's you know what it's saying. Like, it just makes me fucking. No, here's, here's the here's how it is, right? Football manager, we've all played it. We all hate the fucking press conferences. We probably all say the same thing each and every week. But on that big game, you fucking change it up, hoping that you, the the lads have heard that message over and over. This time, this will fire them up, and you get that big performance. Seems disinterested. No, what are you doing? Yeah. No, here, yeah. here. But Deja Lovren comes out and does it every fucking week. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so I can understand why people would think differently about the, Deja Lovren. The the bodies of the dead uh, uh, of of footballers who, who've played for Liverpool who uh, who've tried to do these big these big talk interviews and it's gone completely. to just scattered a litany of them throughout Liverpool's history, particularly when we were a bit crap. You know, your Harry Kules and your Joe Coles used to come out with this bollocks all the time. Like, um, sad. The good thing about it, and again, it's irrelevant because it, obviously it, it didn't happen. But it's why I was quite, I was pleased enough with it. Is that he's got the skills to back it up, and he's the kind of lad who would, who probably would be like back himself to just go and slot a couple at the weekend and, and be like, me you go, okay, thanks very much. Um, right, if you want more on the latest Liverpool news and transfer stuff as well, um, not too much in this podcast. And the transfer stuff, of course, but yeah, get over to the RedmenTV.com. The Reds transfer roundup show is being recorded on Thursday. Um, that's about all you need to know about Liverpool uh, off the pitch. Right, Brighton, Chris. I, look, it was a one. You said win. Brighton, but are we really going to be talking about Brighton? No, we're going to be talking about the agenda. Doesn't say just Brighton. It doesn't. It says Brighton, but mainly Fabinho. Nice. Um, I've done the Brighton bit there. Uh, so Fabinho. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brighton was fine. Um, I, I'm hoping. Um, it's just one of those results that we just we'll forget even happened in a, hopefully in a few in a, in a few weeks time where it was vital that Liverpool got back on the horse we talked about that in the build up and, and and they did and what was one of the most encouraging things to come out of the Brighton game I thought was for, was Fabinho and that could have been you know we've we've had to play players out of position in the past that could have been a disaster it didn't look likely to be a disaster but I, or it could have just been. Bang average. I thought he was. I thought he was absolutely excellent at centre half. Yeah, I, I do as well. And it's mad because you know Virgil Van Dijk will get a lot of credit for it, and maybe more so than Fabinho. And that just shouldn't be the case. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, anyone I mean? can do that job playing alongside Virgil Van but Dijk. But you're actually giving well doing Fabinho a bit of a disservice there because he he's got good defensive instincts and he plays the ball well. And actually, you know, he plays that position more like Matip. On the front foot, mm. defensively, I think I th you know it's hard to say against the Brighton side they didn't get a shot off on target, but with the ball at his feet, he was doing what he was doing from the midfield, and he was trying to hit players further up the pitch and stuff. And it was interesting that actually 
they gave Fabinho more time than they gave Van Dijk. I actually think that was the wrong decision because mm-hmm. I think Fabinho was a better passer than Virgil Van Dijk. Well. Uh, on rewatch, they gave him too much time and space, and he was able to hit uh, midfielders all the time or fullbacks and stuff. So you think of that one where he, he very early on in the game actually the Firmino chance comes from a Fabinho raking long ball. I think their their defender gets a little flick on and it goes to Robertson, doesn't it? And the ball's straight in there to Firmino and he misses that one. That's the type of stuff that Fabinho can do. Defensively brilliant. But on the front foot, his, his speed of thought is excellent. One touch, two touch, that he doesn't dwell on the ball. He just moves the ball forwards quickly. I love watching him play. I love watching him play It's football. interesting because we talk about that we've got a very horses for courses situation going on for things. We still have like our, we, what we perceive to be our defensive fullback is got, or most solid fullback is Gomez. If we want a centre half, he plays it out a bit more. And you've got that going on with it. You'd put Matip in over Lovren if you want your guy who's all heroism and fight and big headers and all that you're putting Dejan Lovren in those situations Fabinho kind of does a bit of all of that and um, I can understand you know we we had the shout uh, I was in the final word about like you know could he be considered for centre like no not now you know you wouldn't be it's too important to the field is the honest answer exactly that like I think you're right you know what but what it also showed yeah you could see the benefits to having well, why Gomez stands out as a centre half as well. Lads who are comfortable in possession of the football, and not just like comfortable like when they're stood still and they've mm-hmm. got time. Lads who are not who are proactive in their use of a football because how many teams let they've got to, you've got to let someone have the ball because it's imp- unless you're going man for man across the entire pitch. Someone you're gonna to have to leave someone in, in, in possession of it somewhere unless you're going full mad bonkers press, and in which case, all the best, by the way. Actually, works better that way, yeah, yeah, for, for having someone like a Fabinho on the ball, exactly that. And that's that's the, the thing is, you want to start to get more, you want to get more and more ball players into your team, and I think this feeds into the decline situation. Why Milner's is absolutely fine to play right back for us, why we love Andy Robbo, Virgil van Dijk's brilliant, but in Fabinho, you can see how if we target another center half. It, he, don't be surprised if he looks a bit like. I looks would. Like Fabinho. I, well, yeah, I'd, I'd actually say that the the prototype is Virgil Van Dijk. Sure. Because Virgil Van Dijk can do it all. Mm. You know. You know. And uh, listen, he might look like Fabinho. Whatever. I don't know enough about Fabinho in centre half to say that would be the prototype. It would just be another Virgil. Yeah. It would be a right footed Virgil in my head, um, because Virgil can win headers, control a line. He's what? What? What would it be? Was it commanding centre back? Yeah. But he he's a cultured commanding centre back in football manager the terms. Complete the centre complete centre half. Centre half. Yeah. He, he, he absolutely is. Yeah. There's no facet of his game that you think that needs improving upon. The only point that I've ever heard raised about him is he sometimes looks lax. Hmm. Sometimes, yeah, that's it. I mean, the, it's a it's a fine balance and act between being absolutely up for the fight and being so cool that you can handle pressure situations and. F- Flicking that switch or just getting the balance set right on that can be a thing, and if that's his biggest issue, then so so be it. I'm not even sure it is. No, no, I I I, I can I can understand and I can see it because you see it a couple of times where he the he gets pissed off with himself, you know, like things where he swings a boot at something. The 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 Virgil the stock Virgil Van Dyke mistake is ball gets whipped in perfectly easily kickable clearable one and he slices his he slices his because he just how waves that foot at it. That happens with his left foot. He plays well, left centre half. That's how that happens and I've I've seen it every single week on watchback. He gets annoyed. He's also probably the best centre back that I've seen with his wrong foot. Yeah. He clears the ball with that left foot more than any other right footed centre half that I've seen. And he, he's he's frustrated because he he probably thinks of himself as both footed and he's not. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it's cool, like and I, I, I that's I think it's a credit to Fabinho when we talk again, we're talking about this versatility of footballer. I genuinely thought we were getting a, a, a proper DM. Just someone who's gonna come in, you know, because 'cause there was talk about some of the players we were linked with, I was like, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind like Stephen and Zonzi, and I wouldn't mind a couple of these other lads who just come in and they go and they and they break play up and they win it back and they knock it on and what have you. And the more and more I see of him, the more impressed I am. And you know, we've not seen him at right back yet, but the point that it remains is that he plays right back for Brazil. He they're fine. Play Brazil are fine playing him at, him at right back. Um, I'm sure he'd be absolutely amazing if he had to play right back for us as well. And this is the this is what we're constructing, and you realise. The quality, he's he's like six foot three, so he wins everything in the air. 
he's got great feet for a big lad, great touch for a big lad. He's pretty fast. He's some podcast that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Not that I've ever listened to it. It's good. But, um, I listen to he's it. Got, like. um, he's got. Yeah, he's got. He's again. He's got a bit of everything. He is. He is Van Dyke esque in that regard. I don't. As you say, I don't know whether that's true of him as a centre half, but as a footballer, there's very little he he doesn't have, and I, I am the. I'm so glad that he settled because it was interesting because you said at the start of the season because everyone was everyone was getting a hard on for Naby Keita and you said I think Fabinho is going to have the most transformative effect on Liverpool's midfield and I'm, I'll admit I, 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 I thought nah, look Keita's so it's so obviously going to be Keita um, yeah I, Fabinho looks we keep you know we break up we make the Riera comparisons the Yaya comparisons if he ends up being after player that either of them were. He's going to be absolutely. Right. I remember, I remember doing a, a, a stats and tactics show on the website. We do it on all the big signings and stuff like that, and all the big players that were close, close to signing. So we, we've done them for you know players that we haven't signed in the past and Nebel stuff. Nabil Fakir, Nebel but we didn't release that one. <laughs> um, and we did one on Fabinho, and we've obviously done one on Cater as well. And I looked at it and thought to myself, he's more than what everyone says he is, you know, because. Uh, Quite frankly, no one watches French football. So you go you go there and I took a ninety minute game and I looked at an entire performance from his in a game and I just saw something that is more than just the DM. You know, he's playing one twos on the right hand side and bombing on. Well he got two assists in two games back to back. One of those was from a one two where he crossed the ball and I think it was to Mo Salah. And it was pretty much exactly what I'd seen on the tape before. Yeah. And you see these things that and you try and you try and imagine how you're gonna how are you going to play? Now, at the time, I was thinking in a 4-3-3. Mm-hmm. I was thinking it'd be that uh, defensive midfielder, but somebody else would sit in while he goes. Yeah. And I thought that what we've seen last season was a fluid front three. I always thought this season we'd see a f- fluid midfield three where it didn't matter who was playing, they could all play the DM. And I actually think that might have been the case mm-hmm. start of the season. Genie, Henderson, Fabinho, Kaiser, any of them can drop in. And I think probably now, with the exception of Kaiser, all three of them, you'd be all right with at six. Um, but Fabinho, when we did, I did another stats and tactics on him not so long ago when he just broke into the side and there were still doubters about him. I think the feedback on the show was this lad's going to be brilliant. Because what, what I say, I showcased, he showcased it, I highlighted it. Yeah. Was this ability for him to play one touch two touch football and you don't notice it during games as much because you focus on where the next pass is yeah. your eyes might drift to where that free man is and the amount of times he plays one touch football is incredible or he'll take one touch and then you'll notice the dink over the top it is his speed of thought and movement and I remember hearing a stat years and years ago when Arsenal were winning the league that they were the fastest passers of the ball in the Premier League mm-hmm. by a country mile a good half a second second faster than the Man United who were chasing them at the time and that's the thing that he does he speeds up our midfield play he might play exactly the same ball as Jordan Henderson in, f- in fact I'd say 75% of the time he will play the same ball as Jordan Henderson. The ball's the ball, isn't it? The ball's the ball, but he plays it faster Mm -hmm. and he moves the team around and he forces them, for example, against Brighton. I felt it was too easy for their five-man midfield to jog 10 yards over while we first half moved the ball quite slowly side to side. I don't think Fabinho lets you do that. He tires you out more. Yeah. And then second half, we capitalise on that. Yeah, very exciting stuff, though. I, I say it's really encouraging to see. And you know, the, when you consider there was a spell at the end of the season, we were just looking, going, "What's the point? What, what, what is he? What does he do?" And I, I keep coming back to it, like like Liverpool in general. You know, uh, he's another one that we're enjoying him at this level. I, I think he's got, he's still got levels to go, gears to move up into. And if we're able to do that, we still say this. We still haven't seen the midfield that Liverpool, the Klopp bought. You know, he, the, the, I mean, yes, obviously, Genie, he brought, he brought in, he's obviously integrated him, but, you know, we still haven't seen a, a potential midfield three of Fabinho, Cater, and Oxley Chamberlain. Mm. And that is a, think about how frightening that midfield could be. That midfield would have absolutely, potentially, have absolutely everything in it, and we're not, we're not even there yet. Cater's not adapted, Oxley Chamberlain's out injured, and Fabinho's only really in the last, what, six weeks? two months starting to really find his feet in the team yeah can't wait cannot wait for that um, we're going to talk on Palace in a second but before we do Chris sat down with uh, the Anfield Raps Neil Atkinson on this week's Newsroom podcast have a little listen to this but these things are all it's all on it's, as I say it's all on like one large graph but I think that that's that's what's at the core of all this and then it becomes we don't want you enjoying yourself and I think there's something else as well with Liverpool and we, we need to remember we feel it we feel it with United in that 
there's a huge number of supporters around the country who had childhoods ruined by how good Liverpool were. Yeah. And our childhood was ruined by how good United were. Yep. So when you see United, if United right now were four points clear at the top of the Premier League, you, me, we'd be thinking, oh no, here we go again. And that's exactly what's happening with us. So when we think, well, why isn't everyone wanting us to do well? You said there was the Henry Winter piece about everyone should be behind Liverpool. Liverpool are doing this and Liverpool are doing this. And they're a club that's connected to the community and they seem like good lads and they're playing really good stuff. And they're up against this Man City side that are a behemoth now. And they, they, cheating. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why isn't everyone behind Liverpool? The reason why is because everyone has a thing somewhere where they're thinking, if they win one, they can win three. If they win, but, if they win one, they can win three get, and we can't stop them. I get that, but... Is this passed down through generations then? Because a lot of, you know, social media isn't our age. No, no. You know what I mean? They're, they can be, I don't know how old a lot of people are on social it is, media. It is, football, the way you think about football, I do think that there's, there is always something in the line about football DNA. Yeah, of course it's passed down. Of course it's there, it's present. It's not just the idea that people sort of saying stuff. It's this sort of folk memory. I, I was, the, the, There's a really good story. Remember when Rush went to Newcastle? Yeah. And my uh, lad who was in our school was at the game and he was at the game with his brother, his older brother, and his older brother was 15 years older than him. And uh, and it was 60 minutes on the clock. And he said, and he, and he went, tell you what, Rush has been quiet. And his older brother went, don't say that. Don't you say that. And then Rush turned, scores, Newcastle win 1-0. And he said his older brother was lived with him. Like, how how dare you tempt the footballing gods of Ian Rush like that? I've, I've, got, I've lived a lifetime of putting up with this, and you've just said Rush is quiet. You never say Rush is quiet. You, and, you can think it, but never <laughs> verbalise. Yeah. Yeah, you can get the Newsroom podcast every single week. Chris sits down with some wonderful people from the world of Liverpool, media, journalism, etc. Neil Atkinson, uh, one of your favourite ones you've actually done? Yeah, I mean, definitely my favourite this year. <laughs> Is that the first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to piss off the other guests. No, They're all good in their own way, you yeah. know what I mean? But I think he's such an interesting bloke, and he, you know, he comes, he comes at life with this sort of large and life effervescent personality and he just brings that to talking about Liverpool as well and he's so fascinating and he's so much more than just the presenter of the Anfield rap and we delved into that like so there's always like some timely stuff that we discuss on the show my favourite part of the show is when I just asked him about their life mm-hmm. and quizzed them about stuff and the decisions and how they got there and stuff and like the Mel Reddy one was fantastic Maddox been brilliant I got Bascom coming up next week uh, Le- Leanne Prescott this week and stuff like going back through the archive Mel Reddy talking to it T- talking to Mel Reddy as a woman in a, f- in a male dominated industry was just mind blowing and I had so much feedback from from people saying I just she was so inspiring to me yeah. and it's so good to hear that we're able to do something just a little bit different mm. than everybody else Yeah, it's a, and, and, and this Neil Atkinson one was as you'd expect absolute giggles Brilliant. Giggles it was. So if you want to see and hear more giggles, get up to redmentv.com and sign up for that. That is uh, amongst the clutch of incredible content that we bring you every single week. I say it's free for the first month. Go over there, check it out. You can get that. You can get, I say, four whole weeks. If you, if you time it right, sometimes it's more than four weeks because that's how months work. Um, and you can see everything that we do. You can trial it. And if you want to keep it, it's just £5 a month thereafter. Um, Crystal Palace. Chris, um, quite simply, just not now, Roy. Yeah, I think you've written that wrong. I'm not going to call him. I'm not going to use the W. No? Not yet. Why? Because I've promised to be, because of the win, because of the win they got over Man City, I promised to be slightly nicer to Roy Hodgson. Um, I don't like him. I don't think he's a good manager. I, I the, the best moment of his entire career, though, was that, that was it BBC post-match interview when he accused the yeah, interviewer of brilliant. taking the piss, which is, if he'd done that at Liverpool, I'd have fucking loved him. I'd have, you know, because, I, 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 yeah, I, I love forthright managers are great, uh, apart from Neil Warnock and his Brexit opinions, which can get in the fucking bin, the weirdo. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Regardless of all this Hodgson stuff, you know, same as like Rafa coming and all these things. I don't think Roy Hodgson particularly likes us. Um, we don't particularly like him. <laughs> you kidding? Yeah, he hates uh, us. Yeah, um, and he will. He would be absolutely made up to come back in here and just you know piss on our chips. Like so, um, yeah, we could very much do with that not being the story of the week. Absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, it's so difficult now for, for me because sixteen more games. 16 more games, 15 more wins, and never felt like this before this early on in a season. Mm. Like 13 14 was 
different and mad, but it didn't feel... We started to hit the accelerator at this point in 13, 14, didn't we? So we were so swept up in how amazing we were, we didn't really... You weren't really aware of the consequences of, 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 of but this what it isn't meant. this this isn't just this season. It feels bigger than that. You know that thirteen fourteen season for me was an isolated event. Mm-hmm. You know, or a series of isolated events, I suppose. Um, this has felt like the culmination of the hard work from Klopp in his four years as, as Liverpool manager, and you know it feels like we've built this the right way. It feels like we deserve as a team, not as a fan base, to be here mm-hmm. um, because they've worked incredibly hard and we've signed right and we've we've recruited well, not just on the pitch but off the pitch. The club's moving in the right direction off the pitch as well, um, and it feels closer to the community again. And I, I, it's almost like if you can. F- fall in love again with something you're already in love with yeah that's happened this season mm. yeah absolutely and it just means so much and like every team i'm just going to be nervous about yeah i'm not I, all these people talk about liverpool being on, on liverpool fans being unbearable and all that i mean that there's a i think overlooks the fact that every fan base has got a massive section of absolute blurts that support them and, and, and vocalize their opinions on social media the vast majority of us i think you know i we it'll just be it's just such a relief. I'm not having a good time. I'm not enjoy. I'm not. You know, we keep preaching this like enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride, yada yada yada. It's not. It's it's all shit. It's not so much of like enjoying the ride. It's like don't be try, try not to be too fucking downbeat about the ride. Try to try to soak in as much of you of it as you can. I I, I equate this season to being at like the best gig I've ever been to in my entire life, and really I'm enjoying it. every song's an absolute belter. But I'm just tired and I'm uncomfortable and I'm sweaty and people are buffeting me I can't fully appreciate the experience of what I'm taking in but I know I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning with the memory of all this incredible gig I just can't be asked to have to go through the process of doing it because it's such hard work for the for, for the reward but inevitably the se- look we're, we're over halfway through this season has flown by more so than any I think I can remember and it's something that's because we're getting older and years do fly by quicker the older you get um, and also sleep deprivation from, from being parents is a big you know just brain damage basically has been occurring over the last you know seven years um, but before we know it it's going to be May and we'll either be champions or we, or we won't be champions and these are the kind of games that I just I, I've got it here we need this spell and I encompass Brighton into this to be yada 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 three points. Yeah, you've got yeah Brighton, you've got this, and is it Leicester? Leicester. We've got off the back. The I don't these need to be hook or by crook, as boring as simple as possible. One nil, two nil. However you want to go about it, get nine points in the bag, and then we'll you know we'll forget this section of the season. Yeah, I mean I I feel slightly differently to you. I am enjoying the ride, but I was definitely enjoying it more in December. <laughs> you know because of the the teams that you beat. Quite yeah. frankly, you know. Um, this you know, is like the, uh, the like. Can you get better than Everton? Yeah, exactly. Can you get better than Can you get better than Shaqiri scoring two against Manchester this United? This is a whole new different set because you're dead right because that Everton thing was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had in football. Finally beating Man United after a spell of having such a tough time against them, you know, beating 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 Arsenal, etc. But these aren't because these, these aren't, are. This isn't this on your heart rate monitor. No. What we're doing now is there's a there's a pressure all season long, but we're not having those huge spikes because we're just dominating sides, and, and that, it's boring, yeah. and it's great because it's boring because I've seen us ship fifty goals a season. It's not fun. Yeah. You know you can be two 0 up and think fucking hell, we need another here. Yeah. We don't need that with this side. So maybe on an individual game by game basis, it's not so cool. But actually, looking back at the entire season, this is the best we've had. Yeah, no, without, well, and without a doubt, and you know, in, in the very obvious terms, the league position tells should tell us everything we need to know. It's that thing, isn't it? We just redefine the little, the little idiot, fearful voice in our heads with every spell of things that come up, and it was, it's those things. I look at these games, and I just, again, I'm not asked. There'll be people who are like. Again, we go, we're going to go back to that world where Man City are playing is it, um, Huddersfield away. They're going to absolutely, they're going to absolutely tank them everywhere. That's going to be another five nil, six nil job because why not? <laughs> and our fans will, there will, be, and I, I, I will cast jealous glances at that. And if Liverpool are making hard work of these games, there will be an external, again, an external pressure, maybe an internal pressure. We look at that and it would be nice just to start dispatching teams and really, really start to fly through things. But um, it's not. Not, not necessary. It's it, we're, but it's also that's where it would be so annoying to have done all this hard work, 
to fuck it against some shit, you know. To, to what do fuck- you think Man City are thinking, sitting there at the moment, thinking, we're bottle jobs? No. No. But, like, they might be if maybe they win more the league. Than, maybe more than Liverpool are, but, yeah. Maybe if they, if they don't win the league this year, maybe they are bottle jobs. Maybe they're the first league champions that are bottle jobs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. They've, got, they've got everything they need to go and be league, league winners. But it's they haven't got as many points as us. This term, so we're work, you know, Liverpool working hard for wins. I'm fine with. Yeah. And you know what? I'd like to see Liverpool score five and six every single week. But I'm also I'm quite happy knowing that we don't rotate that much. Yeah. And I don't think we can put our our foot to the gas quite as much as Manchester City do. And we attack in different ways than they do. And I think they're better at some phases of the game than we are. But we're better at some phases of the game than they are. Yeah. And that's what that you can't. You, you've never had two teams exactly the same, built in exactly the same way. Yeah. You you are your manager on the field and how he wants to play football Guardiola's got one style Klopp's got another Klopp's changed this style because it hasn't worked against Guardiola's or conquering Manchester City side but he's found something that's working right now mm. and we're sticking with it and we should enjoy that yeah yeah absolutely you know goals make that all that easier don't they ultimately but I say it's that thing of we're in that position now where it's it's like that that losing to City is a bit like catching one on the jaw in a big in a big fight and you maybe you you it's not enough to knock you out, but maybe. It, and you, but you know that if you don't gather yourself in the for the rest of the round, then you leave yourself open to that knocker. So if you if you if you try to immediately go a bit too big or whatever back, like oh don't you know, you what you need to do is get your composure, get yourself set again, and just get back to your get back to your game plan because things happen, and that's what this is for me. And it's you know the, the, the teams that we're playing should help us with that. But that, that's why these points are so much more important than the method in which we which we achieve them. Because look, if we win these next two games like five nil, then that could be very important. That could inform how Man City approach the season because they might just think, "Oh God, what's the point?" Because they, you know, not only not only are they ahead of us in points to the match us in terms of performance level, that could have a damaging psychological impact. But realistically, the best thing you can do is just get back to doing what we were doing, get get back to the form and the style that got us to where we are, and then trust that if we need to go up that gear, we've got the ability to, to, Absolutely. to go up the gear. Absolutely, need, yeah. mate. Um, questions this week come from Alan, Alan G, LFC. If Klopp suddenly left Liverpool tomorrow, who would you appoint as the next Liverpool manager? Pochettino. Ooh. Wow, that's a great. Chance. I think he's a great manager, and I always have done, and I love the way his Tottenham side play football, and I don't think it's too dissimilar to how we play either. To mm, be fair, like, I think that's a fantastic shot. I'd not even consider. I, I, I was honestly thinking continuity, and actually, your answer, your, your answer, kind of gives you that because you're right. There's not, you're not reinventing the wheel. If he comes in, he could probably pick up pretty much where we left off with a, with with a, with a tweak or two. Um, and I, so I was thinking either just give it to Pep Linders till the end of the season, or you go. David Wagner's just just left of this field, hasn't he? Just someone who can come in who knows what knows what you've got already. You don't need you don't want another manager to come in with a completely different style and go, oh well, fuck it, defensive football now, lads. Let's cling on for our lives, or you know, X, Y, Z. So yeah, it's um, that's I mean, it fills me with a cold dread the idea that Jurgen Klopp could ever be anywhere other than the Liverpool dugout. But yeah. Thanks for that, Alan. Um, boy of the Wilds. Ryan Babble back in the Premier League with Fulham thoughts. Really? Oh. Oh. Didn't like him when he was here. Didn't you? Don't like him anymore now. What didn't you like about him? Crap. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a great thing when he was, he was he, not, not long when it was his first season, and I heard a lad say that apparently he uh, cut him some slack because apparently he was afraid of crowds, and so he was having to work hard on being able to be in atmospheres like Anfield and stuff, which was the most pathetic thing I think I'd ever heard in my entire life. Um, I like, I, I quite like Ryan Babble. He was one of those players that he he represented the exact right. It was the pe- that was the perfect summer's transfer business. We did <laughs> it that really year. was. We, I think we got Lucas, didn't we? We got Fernando Torres, and we went. So we got you know, Fernando Torres being the big bit of business, the big senior player who takes you up a level, and then you go and get a young lad to develop for the future. And then, you know that early part of that season, I, I, where did I reference it? Was it, early, was it even earlier on this podcast? The 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 Ryan Babble body swerve against Derby and stuff like he showed such great promise. He had an absolute thunderbolt of a shot on him. But the more he played, the more you realised how he was a bit like Jose Enrique 
in that he could beat a man, but he needed them to come to him. If you just left him in space, cold, he couldn't do anything. He'd, sat, he'd sit there, stand there and flounder, whereas he needed to draw people in them because he was great at rolling people and make things happen. But yeah, he never really hit the line. I'm glad to see he's back. And moreover, because it's only, I think it's like a year on from us doing, uh, creating the fake transfer it's be rumor. more than that, really. Yeah, a year, maybe 18 months from creating the fake transfer rumor that he'd signed for Newcastle and fooling several public online publications and a lot of Newcastle fans um, on, the, on the Port Street Deadline Day show. So good to see him. Good to see Brian Papel back in the Prem. He's going to score one absolute wonder goal probably in the next two weeks, and that'll be his. That'll be him done, I reckon. Is he? Has he got red hair now? I did. It did look like that from the from the announcement photograph. Fair play. Fair play. Um, Edgar Alvarez. Edgar Alv underscore ten. Any truth to Liverpool wanting to rival Arsenal for James Rodriguez's signature? If so, what do you guys make of it? This shit again. Can we just go? I'd is, rather talk about Ryan Babble. Honestly. And I don't like him. Honestly. And I've got nothing to say about him. Can we just go one transfer? I saw this like back end of last week. James Rodriguez Liverpool's on news now and I went, I didn't even click it. I was like, it's complete and utter horse shit because he's it's just such an obvious thing. I get. I guess it's, it's loan to uh, to Bayern's finally up at the end of the season. He's been on a two year loan from from Real, hasn't he? Um I guess I f- couldn't fucking care less. His career has he been doing well for Bayern? No idea. I don't hear anyone talk about him anymore apart from in these. He gets linked to us, Arsenal, Chelsea, probably Man United. I think it's rotation. also safe to say we've not really started our prep for the uh, next leg of the Champions League. Yeah, no, absolutely. Without, without <laughs> we'll do that, shadow, you know, without, yeah. 20 minutes before the game. We'll get there. We, no, no time for that. We've got the big boys like Crystal Palace and Leicester to think about just yet. Um, no, I, I would imagine there is precisely zero truth to any rumours about Hamas Rodriguez. Where I don't know where he'd play in that, in that team. The 10, do we really need him? Maybe if he's the player that he was at the World Cup, how many years ago was that? Five years ago now? Yeah. Um, maybe nah fuck that I'd be arsed with James Rodriguez to be perfectly honest I'm let glad you didn't ask me about that because I think he's wank let him sign for let him sign for Arsenal um, and let them all go mad and then let, you know did you see that actually that uh, I think Arsenal fan TV tweeted it the the list of the wage the wages that Arsenal oh players are on days yeah Ezo is on three hundred k yeah. 300k I, but there's some a completely mad one like, Sayed Kalasnac is on like 90 or something no he's on like 120 n- nearly like 200 nearly like uh, it's, well, it's, but then uh, you look at like Callum Chambers he's on 25 yeah. and Holden's on like 40 yeah. or something like that and you're like oh my days there's some proper bad management you can going see on that there. last 12 months where they have panicked and throw money at the problem. That's Lacazette, why Lacazette, Lacazette Aubameyang, 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 A